All right. Well, good afternoon again, Janelia. W welcome back to my kitchen and back to the COVID-19 uh, weekly science seminar series. Today is our first uh, double trouble lecture. We are pleased to welcome two excellent guests from UC San Francisco, uh, Kayvon Shokat and Nevin Krogan. Uh, Kayvon has a uh, long, um, excellent history doing uh, chemical biology correctly, um, you know, mainly focusing on kinases, chemical switches. It's been very impactful work. Uh, Nevin is an expert in proteomics, particularly in the assembly of protein-protein interaction maps for systems and they uh, pooled their resources to attack the problem of a protein-protein interaction map for SARS-2. And uh, I think it's gonna generate a lot of useful discussion and questions. So uh, Nevin will go first. All right, uh, thank you very much for having um, uh, me and us on here. Can I ask, is, is Ron Vale on the call? Is he there? So just assume he is. Okay. Well, Ron actually hired me. Um, so I wanted to say thanks to Ron. And actually, Ron was the chair, and then Kayvon became the chair shortly thereafter. So it's nice to be presenting to these um, uh, older scientists, my mentors. Uh, <laughs> it's going downhill very fast. <laughs> so we're going to be telling you about a, um, a recent, obviously a recent, but very collaborative and exciting project that's been ongoing uh, over the last couple of months. Um, and it actually was just released a few hours ago. Uh, so uh, this is a, a very good timing. Uh, it's how uh, we uh, generated a, a, a SARS-CoV-2 protein-protein interaction map and then used it to identify drugs and compounds that could be used in a repurposing way to um, help fight um, uh, infection. And this was started uh, through uh, QCRG. It's the QBI Coronavirus Research Group. The QBI is the Quantitative Biosciences Institute at UCSF, which I'm the director of. And um, uh, QBI is uh, focused on a couple things, technology and putting technology together in an innovative way and collaboration as well. So we were in a really great position, I would argue, to respond to this COVID-19 pandemic and bring our integrative skill sets together to try to come up with solutions. Okay, next slide. So just an overview of what you're going to hear about today. Uh, we've uh, created the, the first ever blueprint or map of how SARS-2 uh, comes in and hijacks and rewires the host during the co course of infection using all, I think there's 29 or 30 different viral proteins or a protein-protein interaction approach. As I said before, we use this map in collaboration with Kayvon, Shokat, and Brian Shoykit and others uh, to identify uh, were two key drug classes that look very promising, at least in the laboratory setting, in, in terms of fighting off um, uh, SARS-2 infection. Uh, during this process, we identified an over-the-counter medicine that actually appears to be proviral and that it promotes infection that we want people to be aware of. And this work is uh, spurring on the initiation of several clinical trials, uh, which we're very excited about and Kayvon can speak to later. Next slide. So um, in my mind, it's not that big of a surprise we're dealing with this pandemic. If you look at over just the last 20 years, there's been a number of coronaviral uh, infections that have been problematic, uh, starting with SARS-1 in 2002 and MERS in 2012. Those two viruses had a much higher mortality rate uh, than SARS-2, which is, was good. We're dealing with SARS-2 now, but of course, SARS-2 is so much more infectious, and that's been the huge problem in, in trying to uh, uh, contain it. And our work right now is focused on SARS-2, but we're actually going back now looking at MERS and SARS-1 to generate data there to be more predictive uh, about when SARS-3 comes along or COVID-22 or COVID-24. Next slide. All right, so <clears throat> this is the group that we initially assemb assembled, 22 different laboratories affiliated with um, uh, QBI and all the people in their laboratories. And so we're talking about hundreds of different scientists here. And I would argue, I've never seen this before, in an unprecedented way, we've all came together to bring our diverse skill set um, to the table in an integrative way uh, to help understand and ultimately fight uh, COVID-19. So as you can see, we got 
systems biologists, structural biologists, computational scientists, chemical biologists, and virologists here all coming together uh, in a really exciting way. And that's one of the been, in my mind, one of the big pluses of what, one of the silver linings, if you will, out of this really big tragedy is that you see scientists coming together in an unprecedented way, both here and, and around the world as well. Next slide. So you can see this is a truly uh, multidisciplinary um, trans-world uh, collaboration. I think there's over 120 authors um, uh, on this uh, paper. And we have scientists from not just UCSF, but Mount Sinai Hospital, the Pasteur Institute, as you'll hear, but also scientists in Cambridge and England and University of North Carolina and in Seattle and San Diego. So it's been a really exciting uh, collaboration over the last um, a couple months, generating this map, making these predictions, and then testing these predictions. And then now we have potential chemical matter that could be um, introduced into people uh, very, very soon. So it's amazing how fast all of that has happened. Next slide. So just to go a little bit more details into what we've actually done here. Um, so we created a protein-protein interaction map with SARS-2 uh, virus, and we um, cloned out all of the genes, uh, I think 29 or 30 of these genes. Uh, starting in January. And as we've done with many other viruses like HIV and dengue and Zika and Ebola over the past several years, we did these pull downs and looked at the um, co purifying human proteins that we found. And this map has, is really fueling more directed hypothesis driven research around COVID 19 and SARS 2 biology in terms of structural analysis, biochemistry chemical biology, bioinformatics. And one of the goals here is to put all these pieces together to come up with the, the most important human proteins that we think the virus needs, then try to pharmacologically inhibit those proteins and see what effects that has in an infection assay. Um, and then the goal is to take that data and a reader of way feedback into this um, experimental pipeline. I just wanna say with respect to QCRG, we actually have several hundred scientists associated with this group now. And now we have 11 different subgroups. Um, including a drug discovery group that Kayvon's leading, a structural biology group that uh, Oren Rosenberg and Clem Briba are leading. Uh, so it's actually been very exciting how we've been able to um, come together in a very short period of time and try to push the science forward on uh, SARS-2. Next slide. Um, so as I said, um, we've generated these maps in the past. Actually, our first map that we generated was in the top left there, HIV. That's uh, still fueling a lot of, you know, biochemical and structural HIV analysis here at, at UCSF and elsewhere. And we've extended uh, this to obviously a number of other pathogens. But normally what happens, it, it usually takes, you know, at least a year or more to generate one of these maps. But we generated this SARS-2 map in a matter of weeks. And to me, that's a testament to the collaborative spirit, not just with people in my lab, but across all these other 21 different laboratories. It was a, a really a a heroic effort, in my opinion, to, to generate this data in really in a couple of weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, really the last data that came off the mass spec, it was the middle of March. And it was the, that night they actually had the official shutdown of UCSF. Some people can come in, like me, I'm here right now, but it's just mostly a skeleton crew that can come into UCSF. But, uh, you know, it was really down to the wire in terms of collecting that information to generate this map. Um, and, and again, it's a testament to how hard everybody worked to do that. Next slide. So just to give a sense here of um, the timeline, you know, obviously this was a virus that very few of us really knew a lot about at Christmas time. Um, and the, um, the virus was characterized, I think for the first time in the United States, you know, the middle of January. And then the sequence was deposited, I guess, on GenBank, and, and um, a senior scientist in my lab, David Gordon, downloaded that sequence, and it was January the 24th, and a couple of my scientists, he and Gwendolyn Zhang, started to clone these things out. He actually just finished a paper, it was a paper on HIV, so it was like, oh, I got time on my hand, and they were like, oh, why don't we look at this virus? So uh, he uh, started to clone out these genes, and a um, very short time after, we actually got a first draft of the map, again, a testament to how many people ultimately got involved in this, um, at, during, at the end of February and the beginning of March. And then Kayvon and uh, Brian got these drugs and compounds together. We FedExed them off to New York and Paris. That's, uh, what's his name again? This is the FedEx guy is like the hero here. He kept coming in and shipping off stuff. Yeah, Todd. Todd, yeah. We actually put Todd in the acknowledgements of our paper because he was coming in and getting these compounds out to these 
to our collaborators. And then as I was alluding to, we had the shutdown in place in, in, in the middle of March. And then a few days later, um, you know, obviously we're working remotely. We had put out on BioArchive the initial draft of the map and a number of predictions uh, from the map about which drugs and compounds that we thought could work. And as of a couple of hours ago, our paper came out where we actually now show uh, some of the, the predictions being tested and we're excited about a couple of sets of drugs that we're gonna talk about in more detail. And the other thing I'd like to point out is that um, I guess we were the first to clone out all of these genes, um, the whole set. And um, we basically just, uh, we tweeted about it. We said, we have all these constructs and we've sent out these constructs. Actually, the number now is to 325 laboratories in 38 countries over the last probably two, three weeks, two and a half weeks. And we said, no NPAs, we'll pay for shipping, uh, no lawyer stuff. Um, so that, that's been, that's been ver very cool. I've actually had one person coming in full time just getting these packages together and Todd's been shipping them out to places around the world. So to try to expedite research, obviously around SARS too. I think the hardest part was getting the FedEx materials. Yeah, we actually had to go around and steal from all the other labs. There's no one around here anyway, so I think that's okay. We'll have to pay them back, but. We ran out of FedEx materials, but we got a lot now. Okay, so the, the idea here um, is that we're targeting host factors as a therapeutic strategy, right? There's a lot of efforts out there trying to find um, drugs that target the virus, but this is different, right? We're generating the map and then we're making predictions about um, drugs and compounds that'll target the host factor. And I think there's a couple of positives here you know, you don't have to worry so much about resistance, right? Because you're targeting the human protein. And if you remember with HIV, the big issue there was you got a cocktail of drugs that targeted three different HIV proteins, and that's how you overcame resistance at the end of the day. Um, it can get to pan-pathogenic uh, uh, therapies. What we see is viruses are hijacking similar host machinery. And if you have one a treatment for one host factor, it could work for COVID-22 and COVID-24. There's a problem here with toxicity, but I think it's overcome if you're gonna be focused on, as Kayvon and Brian did, on FDA approved drugs and drugs in clinical trials that have passed toxicity. So the effort is to repurpose these to see if they have any effect on infection. I think, Nevin, one thing is that if we had, if people had done the work with SARS and MERS to make direct acting agents, they might have been available now for this, but the companies just didn't pursue that. You know, they did that and then they put them on the shelves because as we showed on that other slide, the, the uh, infection rate uh, sort of subsided. So it's a little frustrating that we knew nearby families that we could have inhibited and just didn't. Well, and also uh, NIH stopped funding coronavirus research, right? And mm. 2003, there was a lot of money and then it just dwindled away. I couldn't agree more that, that we should have been looking at this. We will be now for the next foreseeable future, obviously. Um, so here's a picture of the genome. Uh, there is some debate what the actual numbers are here, but we took a, maybe a conservative view to try to be as inclusive as possible with respect to putative ORF. So we have um, 16 different non-structural proteins. There's no debate about that. Four structural proteins. And then we have these accessory factors in green here, these nine genes, which I think are just absolutely fascinating. There's some debate about if these are expressed or not. I think most of these, if not all of those, have been shown to be expressed looking at these RNA-seq experiments that have been published. And as we were talking about before, there may be some other uh, ORFs that are, you know, being translated here in a more comprehensive look at this, potentially by ribosome profiling could reveal uh, a new ORFs that we should be looking at. The next click. And then what we did, um, we didn't get all 29. There was a, the big one we couldn't get yet. We actually have it now in the lab, NSP3, which is the protease. And there was one other one that, or one or two other ones we couldn't clone. But we got most of them, and what we did was put affinity tags on them, expressed them in HEC293 cells, purified them, analyzed the material by mass spectrometry, and then used algorithms that we and others have developed in the past to come up with a, what we claim is a high-confidence SARS-CoV-2 human-protein-protein -protein interaction map. Okay, next slide. So here's, here's the, a look at the map. Uh, I got to say one thing about this, this map. You know, I've probably looked at 15 different viruses in this pipeline before. This is actually the most interesting in terms of, in my opinion, the different um, biological processes that this virus gets its fingers into. It's a really unique virus in that way. And from a, a research point of view, if you think about it, viral proteins as probes, this is a really great virus to be studying because it really gets at a number of cool complexes and pathways across the board, across many different processes. So um, in total here, 
what do we have? 27 different um, uh, SARS-CoV viral proteins, 332 protein-protein interactions, the circles, the circle nodes, circular nodes are human proteins. If, if it's a drug target, it's an orange node. Um, and then um, we collaborate with this Zoic Labs. They made this really cool interactive way of looking at the data. Kevin loves it. He keeps telling me how great. Yeah, I was going to say, if anybody wants to look at the map, I wouldn't look at the paper. I would go to that site uh, because it really lets you just quickly uh, go where you like on the map. And you got to put on more of the drug and drug compound information in that map too. Yeah, we're going to get that done. Okay. Uh, yeah. So go to that link in the paper and look at the map that way. So we've been doing a number of kind of global analyses with this data, as you can imagine, uh, you know, us and our collaborators, um, taking the 332 human proteins, looking at gene ontology, expression, you know, other data sets that are being generated in the context of infection, global data sets, comparing to our, our other networks and other networks as well. I just want to show one analysis that we did, which I think is pretty cool. So we took the 332 proteins that we identified in HEC-293 cells, obviously a kidney cell, and then we just globally looked at all, every tissue that has RNA-seq uh, data associated with it in human, and we found that collectively those 332 proteins are most highly expressed in lung cells. All right, so even though we looked in a kidney, we're getting proteins that are highly expressed in lung cells, which to me gives us confidence that we're identifying physiologically relevant protein-protein uh, interactions. I think also that other point that it's, we still don't have a human cell line that we can infect reproducibly, but it looks like the next uh, tissue on the list might be the cell line that helps us. So that's also fun, I think. Testes, and actually our, our collaborator, Adolfo Garcia Sastro, who I'll mention in a minute, he actually thinks he's got some success now in a testy cell line in terms of infecting um, it with SARS-2. That, that's, yeah, I, that has obvious implications in the future. So obviously one of the major reasons we generated this map as we've done with other cases is to find cool biology. And the great community here at UCSF is digging into this map. A lot of the biophysical, biochemical and structural community here um, is going deep in here. Here's just one example, which I think is very cool. And it illustrates, you know, if you study one virus, it informs the other virus. And this is work being done by John Gross. Um, he's done some fantastic work looking at colon continuum bicolagase complexes that are hijacked in the context of HIV. There's a number of accessory proteins in HIV that hijack these complexes. So what we found here is with one of these small ORFs, this ORF10, there's still a debate if that's actually expressed. A paper just came out a couple days ago showing that it is expressed, I think, using RNA-seq information. But we found it binding to a COL2 complex, binding to the ZIG11B, this receptor to the COL2 complex. So John Gross is in a perfect position. He has all these components in the lab already. He's studying them biochemically and structurally. So now you can just throw this ORF into the mix and hopefully we'll have a, a structure of this uh, uh, very, very soon. So it's again, a testament to all the um, areas the virus is getting into. And you know, people around here are focused on specific biological processes. They're in a perfect position to start to study some of these connections. Okay, next slide. And then another goal here is not just to get the biology, it's to try to get to something therapeutically valuable as well. Um, and this is where um, Kayvon and uh, I have been working closely with Brian uh, Shoykat over the last few months. He's obviously one of the world's experts on using chemoinformatic approaches to predict new molecular targets um, for uh, known drugs or just understanding, you know, what the targets are with respect to specific compounds into specific drugs. And, you know, we gave him our list of 332 proteins. He cross-referenced using his sophisticated chemoinformatic tools um, with these FDA-approved drugs, these clinical drugs. A lot of drugs that Kayvon knew were in the clinic that just weren't out in databases, as well as preclinical drug candidates uh, to identify a series of drugs and compounds that we think are potentially have the opportunity to fight off COVID-19. Next slide. I think a good point, Nevin, here is like roughly how many compounds are available for repurposing. And there's about 2,000 FDA-approved drugs, and there's like 10,000 drugs that have been in patients. And so other teams have put on bioarchive papers where they've just taken those sets and screened. But, uh, and so that's a rich source for possibilities. But what's great about Ryan's approach is it maps to the map. Each drug is mapped to somewhere on the interaction map. So that gives a good number. 
and it's data driven. I love it. It's rooted in biology, right? A lot of people are just doing these drug screens and you get a hit. You, 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 a lot of times you don't understand the mechanism, but if you start with the biology, then you point it to the chemistry or the potential pharmaceutical intervention. If you get something, you can go back to the biology and be so much more powerful as you guys will hear about over the next few slides. So here's um, a version of the map that uh, Kayvon and his team made in terms of uh, putting on these different drugs and compounds that, um, a target different um, human proteins that we had found. It's color differently approved drugs. There's 69 candidates. I think there's like 29 approved drugs, maybe a dozen drugs in clinical trials and the rest are preclinical uh, uh, compounds. I think this is a nice summary of how these drugs and compounds are put on the map. And what Kayvon made this slide on the left, he was just showing you that, um, as you guys know, remdesivir has been just approved um, at NIH as a, uh, a treatment. Um, and that's the protein that it's ultimately targeting. And I think one of our long-term goals, and we'll maybe we'll circle back to this, is to come up with combination therapies. If we could add one of our host drugs to the viral drug, and in a similar vein to what was done with HIV with these cocktails, where, where it became so successful, I personally think, and I think we think as a group, um, that's uh, where a valuable treatment is going to be coming, hopefully in the near future. And I guess just to zoom up on one piece of this, you know, if you look at this one protein, NSP13, very interestingly, it's uh, connected to the centrosome. Um, there is a centrosome um, uh, compound that can be used. There's, there's protein kinase A signaling. There's also TBK and there's TBK inhibitors. So this is just to give you a sense of kind of the information that we have on this map. Is Kayvon, did you want to say anything else about this? Um, I think that was it. I mean, what I think the neat thing about this, the thickness of the lines tell us the proteomic score, so the likelihood that it might be a direct interactor. And uh, what was fascinating was to be able to dive into the literature and find individual molecules like this WDB molecule that was, it was only reported in the patent literature and we were able to extract it. We still haven't got it from the company yet to try it, but it actually hits one of the highest proteomic scores for interaction with this, uh, this viral helicase. Um, so, yeah. And I guess another point on that is uh, it, the, the thick edges, as Kayvon alludes to, yes, that's also, that's, that's important because we, we show, we've shown before it's correlated with, you know, binding and, and stoichiometry. But then if you look at these in terms of complexes, right, if you, for example, if you didn't know what the centrosome was, you'd say, ah, oh, it's interacting with, you know, 50, a dozen different proteins. But the fact that you know they're in a complex, that gives you, you know, one, it, it, makes, it, it makes you interpret the data better, um, but then it gives you more confidence when you actually see multiple com components of the same complex um, coming up. And what we're doing now is actually tagging and purifying all these human proteins, uh, plus and minus the corresponding viral protein to get a better idea of what their complexes are, because then that helps you interpret the map much more um, effectively. I think we're not going to talk about it too much, but the whole structural side is really digging into this and prioritizing the interactors for crystallography, cryo, et cetera. Yes, exactly. Which is one of the huge strengths here at UCSF, obviously. Okay, so here is um, the 69 existing drugs that we, we actually reported in the bioarchive paper, and we tested about two thirds of these in a, the paper that just came out a few hours ago. And again, it's a mixture of FDA approved, uh, things in clinical trial, and um, those um, that are being studied preclinically. And again, this is a list that uh, Kayvon and, and Brian had coming up with. And we're, now that we get hits on some of this stuff, that augments it in that chemical space. So that allows us to go even deeper. And, and again, knowing the biology, that helps as well to kind of flesh out this chemical space once we get something that looks exciting. This was the, the paper uh, that came out a few weeks ago uh, with the map. Uh, on the left here, um, Kayvon insisted we put this sentence where we filed no IP on any of this so that it is freely available to accelerate the discovery of a treatment, which is, I think, fantastic. That combined with us getting out all these reagents as fast as we can was um, important to us. But there are caveats with having open access that Kayvon's going to say something here in a minute on the next slide. Uh, thank you, BioArchive. That was uh... <laughs> normally rapid dissemination of data is a, is a good thing, and but in this day and age, I guess you got to be a little bit careful about what you put out there. Um, okay, 
So now back to some real scientists. So uh, the, um, we didn't have the virus propagating in San Francisco here in the Bay Area. People like Melanie Otter are doing some heroic work trying to get that virus up and going here. I think she'll have it soon, but we needed to test our drugs and compounds. And we leveraged some really fantastic collaborations that we've forged over the last several years to test our drugs and compounds. And testing them in two different places, in two different continents, getting similar results gives us more confidence that what we're finding is actually real. So we've had a great collaboration with the Pasteur Institute over the last several years. This is between QBI and the Institute Pasteur, uh, most notably Marco Vignuzzi, who's been great, and his team's been working around the clock on this stuff, Olivia Schwartz, as well as Christophe Donfrey. And then in New York, one of my really good best friends really is um, a great virologist in the Department of Microbiology, Adolfo Garcia Sastra. Um, and Chris White, who's an adjunct assistant professor working in his lab, who's been very, working very closely with us um, uh, around the clock, really, uh, which is especially amazing considering he has four young children at home that he has to, to deal with as well. So these guys have been the heroes in terms of generating data for us. I also think it's great to mention what Adolfo is really famous for in virology. <laughs> so he's, he's known... Now it's interesting, when you go to Mount Sinai Hospital, you go in the foyer and you have these big, big pictures of the, of the scientists, which is great. It's like, okay, this guy's come up with a, a drug to treat you know, heart disease, and this guy's come up with an antibody to help you know, with this infection. Adolfo's big claim to fame is that he's the guy that resurrected the 1918 flu. Okay, so he does, he's trying to bring diseases back to the, to the table instead of getting rid of them. But, but that being said, he's probably the preeminent um, influenza biologist in the world, and he's a great treat to work with. Um, so just a little bit details in the assays that were done. They're, they're slightly different, but they're conceptually the same. Okay, so Vero 6 cells were used, African green monkey cells, and as Kayvon said earlier, there's still work on going to determine which human cells are the best. Um, I know Adolfo is screening through a number of them. There is some, you know, CACO2 and CALO3, I guess, are the ones bulbing to the top. They're not great, so they're looking to make them more tractable or find other cell types or cell lines that would work. But for this, we used uh, Vero6. You grow them, you add um, drug two hours before infecting um, with SARS-CoV-2. They did two different MOIs. It was four times higher in Paris. In both cases, they let the virus grow for 48 hours. And then they had different readouts. So in Paris, they looked at the protein, they had an antibody against NP and they did microscopy. Then they're looking at uh, viral assays too, this TCID50. In Paris, Instead of looking at the protein, they looked at the RNA and did RT-PCR, uh, and they did plaque assays um, uh, as well. So it was different assays, but conceptually similar. And I think it was so powerful for us to collect data with both labs using both assays in, in two different continents. Okay, cool. Well, I'll uh, sort of give you a little more background on these cells. Um, when we were getting ready to receive the uh, antiviral data, uh, became clear that since we had so many molecules that had emerged from so many different drug uh, discovery programs, that it'd be important to understand how we expected these Vero cells to respond. And these are the go-to cell line for um, culturing emerging pathogens. As Nevin said, they're from an uh, African green monkey uh, that has isolated, cells isolated in 1962, and they're highly susceptible to various viruses. Um, they do have the ACE2 receptor on them, uh, so that's the um, spike protein target. Um, they are pseudodiploid um, and immortalized, but they don't have oncogenes in them. But interestingly, the two features I think that are going to be important for us to consider are that they um, have a homozygous deletion on chromosome 12, which means they have lost alpha and beta interferon genes which uh, make them highly, highly susceptible because they're, all the interferon response is absent here. They still have the receptor, but they don't have the interferon. Um, and then they're also um, null for two tumor suppressors, one that is uh, CDKN2A, which is an inhibitor of CDK4 cell cycle progression, and then one which is an activator of P53. So it's a, a very, very permissive um, uh, cell model. And um, so both groups uh, received uh, many compounds as Todd, our FedEx uh, delivery person, could uh, get sent out to them. Uh, and uh, they um, did 
really a heroic job during this pandemic to do full dose responses for all uh, molecules that were able to be tested. Um, so far, we've tested 47 of the 69 that we um, had, had sent them. And really about 10 agents showed selective efficacy in killing the virus and permissible uh, cytostasis or cytotoxicity. Uh, and the great thing I think that Nevin made the point of is that rather than uh, doing things over and over and over again in one lab and one set of cells, we immediately were able to do things simultaneously and cross-validate uh, and all the uh, labs were incredibly great at sharing data with each other. So we really knew it quite quickly. Two that we'll tell you about are uh, inhibitors of uh, protein biogenesis, mRNA translation. Um, and these are Zotatafen, an EIF4A inhibitor, and Ternatin4, an EF1A inhibitor. Uh, and then probably the newest biology that is emerging that is uh, actually actionable are these um, modulators of sigma R1 and R2 receptors, which were, um, are, are off targets of a number of existing drugs like antihistamines, antipsychotics, malarials, hormones like progesterone, anti-anxieties, and preclinical mo molecules. So this is where Brian's expertise uh, that um, structure enrichment uh, approach really uh, shined because we were able to home in that these were the common targets of a whole set of molecules that we found to be actives. And then we could dial in and out their other uh, targets and we'll tell you about that. So just to give you a little idea in a couple of the nodes, um, we already talked about remdesivir, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase direct viral inhibitor. That's inhibitor of NSP12. And on the left, you can see, so uh, this is the only slide where black is the percent infection and red is the cell viability. This is some data from uh, uh, Sumit Chandra's lab from BioArchive that just went online last week. Uh, and you can see that the direct acting inhibitor has an EC50 of 600 nanomolar, and the cells, Vero cells, are quite um, uh, tolerant of, of the molecule. That's expected since this is uh, targeting the viral protein and does, shouldn't, should be able to dial out all the host factor targeting. This dashed line roughly represents the starting cells at time zero, so uh, we can kind of get an idea, and you'll see this later over here. So as we go to different host factor target uh, molecules like the RIP kinase 1 inhibitor, uh, panatinib, or the BRD2-4 degrader molecule, this is a, a binder based on a molecule called JQ1 that binds to BRD2 and 4, and then it has a uh, thalidomide piece that brings in uh, an E3 ligase to degrade. And you can see that um, these two molecules really didn't pass our uh, test and were deprioritized because they basically affect cell viability, viral RNA, as well as viral titers, almost in parallel. This DBET6 molecule in particular has lower infection, but the cells die at exactly the same rate. And importantly for us, they go below uh, the starting cell population. So that means these molecules are at these doses in fact, toxic to the Vero cells and kill them. So this is really what we're uh, important information, but not something we would move forward with. And I mentioned protein biogenesis was a, uh, a really highlighted um, vulnerability that we think we can exploit. And you know, this is a positive RNA stranded virus. And so in the host, um, in the host factor map, we saw many interactions with factors that regulate RNA biogenesis, uh, activators of things like a, the helicase EIF4A, a compound, uh, a host factor called EF4H, which activates 4A. So once we saw all that, we collaborated with other people at UCSF like uh, Davide Ruggiero and Jack Taunton to bring in all of their expertise uh, and molecules that targeted every step that we could uh, think of. And that included an inhibitor of a mink kinase that phosphorylates the cap binding protein EIF4E, 
a protein-protein interaction disruptor of 4G and 4E. There's a tadafin molecule, an inhibitor of 4A. Ternotin is a didemnin-related molecule, if you're familiar with that natural product. It binds to the ribosome and the EF1A uh, factor. We also saw in the map uh, several um, signal recognition particle uh, host factors pulled down. So we used this cotransin molecule um, that Jack Taunton's lab uh, discovered so that we could block cotranslational translocation. So if we look through this uh, sort of clockwise, the four MNK inhibitor really didn't differentiate, didn't show much antiviral activity. This protein-protein interaction molecule, a lot of noise, but no real antiviral activity. So Tadafin, however, showed something very interesting. So you see that at the beginning doses, this is in black is cell viability of viral cells without the virus. In red is the, um, the percent of cells that have viral proteins by the microscopy assay. And in green is the viral titer. And so you can see that the compound does induce stasis. And remember, I told you that the starting concentration of cells would give about this level of, of, uh, of ATP measurement in the cells. So the compound isn't killing the cells. It's just not letting them proliferate. But the antiviral effect is very potent. And this is a log scale over here for the viral titer. And you can see at the very beginning doses, you know, one nanomolar, 10 nanomolar, you can uh, see almost a one log drop in the viral titer, which is the clinically uh, sort of um, relevant level of viral titer inhibition. You can even get more viral titer inhibition and it goes down very nicely. So this is a very attractive target. Uh, it is a, in phase one for cancer uh, therapy. And um, in fact, because it blocks cyclin D, we think, uh, so EIF4A is important for translation of the cyclin D mRNA. So this drug was put in the clinic to kill uh, these kinds of cells that lack tumor suppressors like these Vero cells do. So the fact that we see cytotoxicity, we think when we take this into non immortalized cells, we will um, sort of see a lot less toxicity. And in fact, in the clinic, the drug has been increasing its dose escalation without an MTB yet. So we're very optimistic about that one. Ternotin-4 is also very interesting because it shows similar cytostasis, but also very good antiviral response. This molecule has a clinical uh, a cousin called plididepsin, and once we saw this data, Jack Taunton, who provided the molecule, uh, pointed out that a company in Spain, Pharmamar, had been uh, trying to open a clinical trial in COVID patients. So as we saw this molecule was active, uh, we saw the company that had the clinical version moving into the clinic, not based on this data, but they happened to reach out to Adolfo, who we mentioned, and ask for his help, and he knew this data, so he got even more excited. So it's amazing how much real-time convergence we've been seeing over this period. Uh, just a quick example of my own personal disappointment uh, in the map. I had hoped that one of the drugs we had spent years developing, this active site mTOR inhibitor, sapanacertib, would pan out, but as you can see, it uh, causes cytostasis and almost no antiviral effect. So this just tells us that these molecules are selective, but the virus doesn't co-op all factors and features of mRNA translation. It's really going at one aspect or another. So these drugs are helping us figure that out, uh, I think, in real time. I think Nevin's lab usually does CRISPR uh, to uh, really test the directionality of the host factors. But since we didn't have time for that, Using this pharmacology has been a stand-in, but it also gets us close to uh, the clinic. So um, I think uh, the last set, uh, the second group of agents we're really excited about are these um, sigma R1, R2 receptors, and they came down in the map uh, associating with two different viral factors, NSP6 and ORF9C. And these receptors are fascinating. This is really the work of Brian. Uh, we brought in experts like Andy Cruz from Harvard who solved the first crystal structures of, of sigma R1. 
And these are somewhat orphan receptors, but the virus is really pointing us at maybe some of their functions. We're just beginning to understand that. But pharmacologically, they were identified pharmacologically in mu and kappa opioid uh, programs, radioligand binding. And the first molecule that stood out, I still remember when the New York group sent us a late night email uh, showing PB28. You can see it has a very nice antiviral response on the viral cells. It uh, shows no real toxicity. The green is the viral titer, and that drops off very, very nicely. In the same data set, we saw hydroxychloroquine, which we were reading and hearing a lot about uh, and still are. It has a similar antiviral, pretty good uh, tolerability uh, on the viral cells, uh, and the viral titers uh, drop. So these two molecules told us that um, sigma R1, R2 were likely to be uh, relevant host factors that we could pharmacologically target. So then Brian's group dug in uh, to the pharmacopoeia and found more and more agents uh, that would have these features. And as I mentioned early on, a lot of these uh, antihistamines, psychotics, antimalarials, hormone, hormones like progesterone have off-target effects on the host factors, sigma R1, R2, that we think are the most relevant. And so we had PB28 was our sort of preclinical signal finding molecule, uh, but then cloperastine was quite good. Now you'd look at hydroxychloroquine and you'd say, well, that's similar. It's not that different uh, on this uh, uh, cell assay. Um, why not just, um, you know, let the hydroxychloroquine trials read out. The problem is that hydroxychloroquine uh, and many of these agents also hit the Herg channel, which is involved in repolarization of cardiomyocytes. So this is a very severe known strong liability of drugs. And about 20 years ago, it was discovered uh, that drugs had these effects uh, and they were all pulled from the market. Um, and so when you try to dose hydroxychloroquine high enough to get the sigma R1, R2 binding, you bring in the Herg channel binding, which brings in the cardiac liability. So in Brazil and in France, we've seen trials get shut down. So we think this is data from Brian Roth's lab at UNC. Uh, we think that this is the reason for the liability. So to get the best in class molecule, we're looking for more selective R1, R2 ligands that will dial out the Herg binding. And um, I think I'll hand it back to Nevin and there'll be another point about sigma R1, R2 as well. Thanks, Kevon. Um, one of the things I just wanna say, one of the great things that I've seen over the last few months is Kevon transforming in from a chemical biologist to a virologist. He was talking, he was given a, you were given a presentation to UCSF, a couple hundred people talking about virology and you were actually answering questions about virology and that was, I, that, that's quite remarkable. I'm asking now asking Kayvon questions about virology. Um, so that's his new, that's his, your the next chapter of your career, Kayvon, I guess. I don't even, I, I sometimes wonder who's even talking. Tell me about it. <laughs> so, so if you want some virology um, questions answered, you go to Kayvon. So um, I think this is a neat experiment here that the crew in New York did. So if you remember the way the assay was done before is that we added the drug, waited a couple hours, and then infected. Okay, but here's a situation where we did a time course in terms of when we add the drug. So we added it like we did before, um, a minus two hours infection, right at infection, and then two and four hours post-infection. And we're doing this at an incredibly high MOI, about at least 10 times higher than we did in the other experiments. So there's a lot of virus in there. And what's great to see is that even after you've infected cells, the, the drugs that we're actually most interested in still have a, a very strong antiviral effect. That says a couple things. You know, um, first it says it's probably not entry that um, these drugs are having an effect on. They're getting into the cell and the, they're having an effect on specific host proteins. That, that's our model. And I guess if you could extrapolate this to humans, I don't know if you should or not, but if you try to, you'd say, all right, this could be working um, if, if somebody uh, is uh, infected um, with a lot of virus, there could be some positive effect. You know, obviously the tests have to be done in humans, but that's one thing that you could extrapolate from this information. It's a, kind of a simple experiment, but there's a lot of, of mechanism you can extract from it. You know, some different observations here. You know, Kevin talked about sigma one um, and two receptors. Uh, they're perturbing the virus through seemingly different mechanisms than what, what uh, we've seen with 
Kavon's translational inhibitors, potentially through you know, cell stress response. And it comes back to this point about combination therapies. I think we're very excited about that. Trying these in combination, that's the experiments we're doing right now, taking from one class and the other two host factors. But then we're also doing experiments with remdesivir, combining each one of these with remdesivir. And uh, we're very hopeful that some sort of combinational therapy of the future will, will prove uh, to be successful. And those are the ongoing experiments right now. Um, so one thing that we did find here as we were targeting sigma R1, R2, we were look, Brian was predicting antagonists, which of course inhibit the function and correspondingly um, infection went down. But then you can look at agonists um, like dextromethorphan that is known to be an agonist for sigma R1 and R2 um, and, and turn up its activity. And uh, here we actually found infection getting better. Um, so for me, it was great from a scientist point of view, you're right, we, we have this pathway, we think this is the right pathway. You can turn it down, infection goes down, you can turn it up, infection goes up. This gives us a lot of confidence that we're targeting the right couple of receptors. But of course, there's other you know, consequences here that um, dextromethorphan is pretty much in every single cough syrup that one can get. And if you have COVID-19, you're coughing, obviously this is something you'll be uh, taking. Now that's a big jump from showing proviral activity in the lab and cells to does it have any proviral activity in, in humans? We have no idea. Um, but this is information we just thought we should be pointing out to the scientific community and beyond that we do see these things. With the strong caveat, more work has to be done to see if there's any proviral activity in, in humans. All right, so what's next? You know, we shared this information with drug makers, government authorities, um, uh, pub public health officials. Uh, several companies are taking these agents into clinical trials. Came on alluded to some of that work. We're continuing our research on, on COVID-19 in a variety of different ways. We're very excited about going after the host um, for a number of reasons, including the potential for it to have pan-pathogenic applications. I think we got a couple more coming up here, Kevin. Oh, there you go. Obviously, we want to be resuming our research on other non-COVID-19 um, areas in the near future. But I'd like to just make a few final comments here about, I think what we've learned from studying COVID-19, especially in terms of the kind of collaboration we can do and how fast we can move, I'd like to see that type of spirit be brought back to us studying other uh, uh, disease areas and other you know, biological uh, uh, mechanisms. And I mean, for me, it's always bothered me. Science, it, one of the problems for me is it's so siloed, right? And it's siloed across many different areas. Um, and what we've seen is how fast we can move when we break down these silos and we all work together. And there's silos across different laboratories, just as using us as an example, you know, 22 different labs and now actually it's over 30 labs. We've all come together in a really unprecedented way. Um, uh, not concerned about credit, just trying to get answers. We broke down silos across different institutions. We talked about some of that. And then also across pharmaceutical companies in academia. We're talking to a number of pharmaceutical companies trying to translate some of our findings um, uh, more quickly. So, um, you know, the question I have is when the dust settles on COVID-19, why can't we come back and do research this fast? Look how fast we move. It was like Kayvon's timeline. We didn't even know about this virus at Christmas. And here we are, we cloned out the genes, we made the map, we made predictions about drugs and compounds. We set up virological assays, we've tested those, and now we have some chemical matter that actually looks quite promising that could be moving into humans in a matter of three months. Why can't we do this all the time? You know, so I, I would argue that the, the infrastructure of science needs to change. And now's the time to be doing that so that we can move this fast in the future so that we can collaborate with all these different great groups. Obviously, we talked about QBI, Mount Sinai, Pasteur Institute, um, but there's so many other entities and groups that were involved uh, ultimately in this um, uh, collaborative effort. Uh, across the, uh, the world. That's how we could move so fast and that's how we should be moving fast in the future through collaboration. And I think that's... that the last slide, no? Uh, was oh. it more? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you want to take this, Kevin? You go for it, I, yeah. All right, so we got Todd again here. So he was shipping out drugs and compounds to New York and Paris and also shipping out all those plasmids to all over the world to these 38 different countries. So. When, when, when things calm down, Kayvon, we've got to take him for a beer. And, yes. <laughs> uh, and then we highlighted the authors acknowledge their partners and families for support in child care. So um, I have slightly older children, not quite as old as Kayvon, but a lot of the, the people had 
much younger children and they, they really did an amazing job working at home putting all of this together. So this uh, should definitely be acknowledged as a, a huge support system for all the scientists. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks uh, Lauren and Serato for inviting us. Yeah, well, that, that was excellent. Um, so I know that you guys have to go uh, promptly um, in and out uh, in 10 minutes. So uh, this will be a fairly um, efficient Q&A uh, session. Um, the first one up, this comes from Hershey and a couple other people. Um, since a lot of the molecules that you talked about are already existing drugs, um, do we have much data on um, people that were already taking them and how they're faring? Like for instance, if, lup if lupus patients were not dying of COVID, that would have been an early point in favor of chloroquine, for instance. Yeah, I think that's going on. People are looking uh, in, in that. There was a, um, uh, a fascinating story on Monday in science uh, where people did that kind of analysis in China and found people on antacids like Pepsid seem to have lower infection and then uh, uh, so, so people have been uh, sort of uh, really going after that, and we identified that molecule as a sigma R1, R2, or Brian did as a ligand. So people are doing exactly what you said. Awesome. Um, second question, uh, this is a combination of a couple of people's questions, is asking about 2.0 versions of the screen. Um, and, and what would you prioritize he, here um, are a couple suggestions. Um, uh, you're, you're using only one viral ORF at a time as bait. You know, you could imagine that two of the viral ORFs are, you know, let's say they're obligate dimers. Um, you know, it, so are you going to do, um, you know, multiple viral ORFs, maybe the whole viral um, proteome at the same time? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, ironically, I was just talking to David Gordon. He's in the lab working. There's certain complexes that you want to be looking at, right? The three protein polymerase complex. So obviously, we just looked at these one at a time. That's the first iteration. Now what we're doing is co-expressing all three with a tag on one of them, verifying them, and seeing if we identify um, ultimately new interactions. A goal also would be, and we've done this with our viruses, is to try to put a tag on the viral genome. That's not going to come anytime soon, but uh, maybe a second best that's worked for us in the past is to express a take protein, then infect and do the pull downs in case you need other viral proteins there. But another key point is when we find a key human protein, say is like sigma R1 and R2, we take that using CRISPR on the genome and then infect and then pull it down temporally, analyzing how the protein protein interactions change. So there's so many different experiments that are going to be done. And just along those lines, too, we're looking at SARS 1, we're looking at MERS, we're looking at coronaviruses that aren't as virulent, we're looking across different cell types. We're also looking at bat cells as well. So there's so much more information that we're going to be collecting over the next you know, foreseeable future. And for the, for the drug screen, we want to get it into a human cell that has interferon response uh, because we think a lot of the host factors are probably restriction factors and things like that. And we're not, we're not scoring that. So we think we have, I think we have some false negatives right now. That... Yeah, that, that, that was the next one of a 2.0 screen is a cell line that does have interferon signaling. Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you give interferon to these viral cells, the virus won't infect. So it's amazing. You know, it's very lucky. <laughs> good, good interferon response. Yeah. Um, then I, I had a version of that. Um, it, I, I know this starts to get into the weeds, but could you do cell lines that express different human alleles of, of certain proteins? Hmm. Well, I guess along those lines, you know, we're looking at different variants of the virus, different m mutations and seeing what effects they have on the, on the network. But then also, you know, we've done this with other viruses, more to your question, uh, looked at, you know, there's gonna be a lot of genomic data out there. There's sets of people that are resistant and susceptible. And, and can we find these rare variants or these, you know, these variants, I don't know how rare they are, um, in these genes. And then how do those particular variants uh, perturb the map? at the end of the day, right? So I think it's, again, you know, this map is the foundation to be comparing to a lot of other types of information, including that. So um, you've never, I don't think it's hard to find a, a disease or a virus where you have this kind of range of response and it has to be 
something to do with the genetics. And I think once we find some of these variants, this map is going to be very useful, or at least these approaches that we're employing to try to get, understand the underlying biology behind resistance and susceptibility. And hopefully that leads to novel therapies and, and treatments. Yeah. Um, and piggybacking off of that, um, there are two questions about why more men than women are dying. Um, you know, it could be, you know, a, a fairly boring answer that women are in general more healthy or have a more robust immune system. But um, Royan noticed that after the lung, the next tissue up is the testis. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not certain, I haven't heard any reports of, of SARS-2 directly attacking the testis, but is that maybe indirectly telling you something about what men are expressing versus what women are? I, I think um, that's interesting, but I think maybe in our data, in our data that we presented, maybe the more telling piece of data would be that progesterone seemingly has some, at least some antiviral effect. And there was some talk earlier maybe last week or earlier this week about estrogen being used as a, and maybe it's progesterone should be the one that used. Again, that, that's just, you know, data in a laboratory that has to be translated into people, but that, that could be potentially some underlying biology behind it. I don't know, Kayvon, do you have any thoughts I, on that? Yeah, I think those sigma R1, R2 receptors also have some endogenous sterile-like ligands. And I don't know if we know if there's any sex differences in those, but that could be, even beyond the hormones, there could be something. So that's, again, a point of this, these are orphan receptors, and uh, there's a lot to discover. But I do think females are more healthier than males in general, so that has to be contributing to it at some point. Yeah, they, yeah, they, there's a lot there. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Charles Zucker is on the call, and he says hello. And uh, also he wanted to uh, point out the Pepsid uh, result um, what, what is the, um, what's the proposed mechanism for that? Is it direct inhibition of the protease or is it, um, something with, you know, a, a lot of viral processes are acid dependent? Is it more of an indirect pH effect? It, it was proposed in that science piece that Kevin alluded to that it was binding directly to the protease. Although I don't, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that. So it, it's gotta be doing something else. I don't know, Kevin, what do you think? Yeah, this, this acid neutralization, I mean, hydroxychloroquine is thought to do that in uh, endosomes, lysosomes. But to me, that's always been a little perplexing because a lot of drugs have those kinds of nitrogen heterocycles and they don't all do that. So I think they bind to some proteins and that's why we're excited about this R1, R2 potential. So it's a great question. Um, and uh, for Charles, if he needs some Pepsid, uh, I stopped up with it. <laughs> Excellent. I'll pass that on. Uh, actually, that, that compound in Pepsid, we actually tested in our assays. It had no effect. Th that's not to say it doesn't have an effect in mammals, obviously. I mean, it could be something more along the cytokine storm. You know, I don't know. It, it's good point. There's a chemical yeah. trial going on right now, so I'm very curious to see what happens with that. Um, let, let's see. We've got a couple more good ones here. Um, Sujata points out that ACE2 is, is X-linked. So uh, could, could expression levels of ACE2 be, be underlying the sex differences? Yeah, very good. I, I didn't know that, that's very cool. I, di I didn't know that either. I was wanting to look into uh, any of the host factors and whether they were X-linked or not, but I don't know if we did that analysis, so that's great. That's good. Yeah, I mean, maybe you could, maybe that would be a great, um, 2.0 version of the screen would be doing, you know, feminized versus masculinized yeah. cell lines and see if anything popped up. Yeah, we were doing, that's the, that's uh, African green monkey is female and then A549 was our next best and that's a male uh, lung cancer, but we should do more of those and keep them. I think it's a great idea. Well, now that you're a virologist, Kayvon, you got to get on that stuff, right? <laughs> All right, um, I think we'll just, uh, since you guys have to go, I think we'll just give you one, um, one last question before you go, and it's more of a big picture question. Uh, this is from Tim Ryan, who also says hi. Um, and, you know, your last slide, uh, you know, left us with, you know, de definitely we need more of this collaborative Manhattan Project scale 
work in science, do, uh, maybe just can you say, do you think that's realistic or is it just going to go right back to, you know, the normal academic grind after this is over? I, I think it's going to change. The question is how much are we going to change? Um, I think what you're seeing here, it, it better force a change. Um, you know, I'm only interested in projects that one or two labs can't solve at the end of the day, right? And it's been so exciting for me to bring together chemical biologists, virologists, structural biologists, and in such an unprecedented way. In some ways, that's really systems biology. That was the kind of goal of systems biology, in my opinion. We're seeing it in, in action here. So one of my primary goals, if not my top goal, is to work as hard as possible to retain this, this vibe and change, help change the system where we can do this again and again and again. Yeah, because after this, we have to do climate change. So I hope you guys are ready. <laughs> we only do one career switch. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kayvon, Nevin, that was amazing. Wow. Um, but we'll let you guys go. And thank you so much. Thank Thanks you for inviting us. Stay well, everybody. Likewise.